I admire your luck, Mr. Bond. James Bond. 14 books, 26 movies, seven different stars. License to kill? More like a license to print money. Since the first Bond story in 1953, all the way until today, Bond has been a staple of pop culture spy stories. Through the decades, the character has evolved and adapted, all while remaining at his core the archetypal suave super secret agent. But did you know that David Bowie almost played a Bond villain? Or that John F. Kennedy is largely responsible for James Bond's popularity? Where did Bond come from, and how has the character changed since his inception? Who's your favorite Bond, and what's your favorite Bond movie? Leave a comment and stick around. Let's talk about the history of Agent 007, James Bond. The Martini, shake him and stir. His name's Jaws, he kills people. Don't print anything these days. James Bond was created in 1953 by British novelist Ian Fleming. Fleming came from a wealthy family and went on to serve in the British Naval Intelligence Division during World War II. His time in British intelligence heavily inspired the creation of his character James Bond. The first book featuring the character was Casino Royale, which centered on Bond as an officer in the secret intelligence service, known as MI6. Fleming says that the character of Bond is a mixture of secret agents and commandos he'd met during the war, and those close to Fleming say that the character was something of an aspirational fantasy for Fleming himself, since he was more of a desk jockey during the war. Didn't see much action. Fleming published 12 Bond novels and two short story collaborations, but they weren't an instant hit. The Bond books were largely criticized for being vulgar and having poor pacing. So how did this series become so iconic? Believe it or not, you can thank JFK. Yep, Bond's first big break came when former President John F. Kennedy listed From Russia With Love as one of his favorite books. Naturally, sales for the James Bond book skyrocketed after that, and producers scrambled to get Bond onto the big screen. Eon Productions, owned by Harry Saltzman and Albert Broccoli, snatched up the film rights to the character and got to work on a live-action adaptation. Financers of the film insisted on a well-known actor to helm the leading role, but Saltzman and Broccoli insisted on casting an unknown performer. After a long casting process, the production settled on Sean Connery because of his good looks and physicality. One producer from the time noted that Connery was a big guy who was light on his feet like a cat, which was rare. Dr. No released on the same day as the Beatles' first single, October 6th, 1962. A single day that represents 1960s Britain in a nutshell. Fun fact, the familiar silhouette in the opener isn't Bond, it's stuntman Bob Simmons. Connery would star in seven Bond films total, but that count is messy. We'll dig into that in a minute. During Connery's tenure as Bond, the character became an instant style icon, having a huge influence on fashion for men and overall design trends. He was no longer just a character, Bond was a brand. There were Bond puzzles, Bond vodka, miniatures of the Aston Martin he drove, merchandise. Merchandising. Of course, the character was also parodied to no end from the get-go. Roger Moore actually first showed up in the role as Bond in a 1964 episode of British comedy sketch show Mainly Millicent. Little did anyone know at the time that his funny Bond persona would come in handy later. Connery quit playing Bond for the first time after You Only Live Twice, which, fun fact, was written by Roald Dahl, best known for writing kids' books like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. It's hard to imagine now, but when Connery left the franchise, a Bond replacement seemed unthinkable to the public. What was at the time the series' biggest crisis is now a major feature of the Bond franchise, the willingness to recast and adapt with the times. That's exactly what's kept Bond alive. George Lazenby was the first actor to follow up Connery's portrayal, but his time as Bond was not meant to last. After the release of Her Majesty's Secret Service, Lazenby insisted that the Bond franchise should embrace the hippie counterculture of the era. You. You want him to look like a hippie? He wanted Bond to be a little less 1% and a little more Easy Rider. Of course, that suggestion was outright rejected. Even though it was still relatively early for Bond, the series had a winning formula that wouldn't change that much. Lazenby parted from the series after starring in a single Bond movie. Connery then came back for the next film, Diamonds Are Forever, now with more bargaining power than ever before. Diamonds represents the first real tonal shift of the franchise. The writing is a lot quippier and less buttoned up British than previous entries. Hi, I'm Plenty. 
but of course you are. Despite this refreshing change, Connery left the series once again, feeling that the Bond trend was on the way out. Roger Moore was next to play Bond. Moore picked up the role almost right where he left it in the mainly Millicent sketch, playing a funnier Bond that went hand in hand with the quippier writing established in Diamonds Are Forever. People were ready to hate on Moore in Live and Let Die, and so the studio preemptively tried to cash in on current movie trends to help please the audience. And so Live and Let Die is oddly caught between the typical Bond elements elements mixed with black exploitation and kung fu. Reception was lukewarm, and to this day, Roger Moore is largely considered the least liked Bond. But the studio was determined to make Moore's Bond stick. The Spy Who Loved Me finally convinced the world to let this new era of Bond stick around with its ambitious opening stunt and iconic villain, Jaws. It was a huge success and immediately followed up with Moonraker. Due to audience demand, fan favorite Jaws was brought back as a villain, something that hadn't been done in the series until this point. At the same time as Roger Moore's reign as Bond was happening, Connery returned for an unofficial remake of Thunderball, aptly titled Never Say Never Again. Between legal battles and production drama, the strange history of this film could be a video in and of itself. Suffice to say, Never Say Never isn't technically a Bond film, but also, it definitely is a Bond film. With Roger Moore starting to show his age, and after starring in seven Bond movies, it was time again to recast and give the series another facelift. Timothy Dalton would be the fourth actor to play Bond, debuting in 1987's The Living Daylights. He was a more hard-edged James Bond, a version of the character to contend with the tough 80s action heroes from that era. Dalton says he worked hard to play the character more accurately to the Bond in Fleming's novels. Dalton only portrayed Bond in two films, The Living Daylights and License to Kill, the latter considered by many to be the most violent Bond mission. With the end of the Cold War and the dismantling of the Berlin Wall, the world, and especially Europe, was changing. Without the Cold War to fend off, Bond seemingly had no purpose. The character would go on a long hiatus until 1995. Pierce Brosnan was next, and he was more than the typical recast. His version of Bond was saddled with proving that the character could still work in the 1990s and beyond. GoldenEye had the modern action sensibilities that audiences were craving, along with a touch of modern self-awareness that managed to bring a little more dimension to the kind of masculinity that Bond represented in previous iterations. Because I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur, a relic of the Cold War whose boyish charms, though wasted on me, obviously appealed to that young woman I sent out to evaluate you. GoldenEye turned out to be exactly what the franchise was in need of. A sick N64 game with the best silenced pistol sound effect of all time. And learning to hate Odd Job because he's too short to shoot. No Odd Job. That's the rule. Even more than that, across four films, Brosnan's Bond gave new life to the series and turned it back into the massive box office attraction it once was. Despite bringing Bond back, this era of the series definitely got a little too ridiculous at times. No doubt due to the seemingly limitless advances of CGI at the time. Clearly, sometimes limits are a good thing. For the next era of Bond, the franchise went back to basics, injecting some much-needed realism into the series. In 2006, that meant parkour, shaky cam, and lots of dusty grit. Daniel Craig's casting as Bond sparked nonsensical controversy as fans deemed his hair to be too light for 007. But the the boycott was quickly forgotten, however, after audiences witnessed the first action set piece of the film. This high-octane scene chased off any doubt that fanboys had going into Casino Royale. The most recent take on Bond and subsequent sequels have been largely considered by many to be the best Bond movie since Connery left the franchise. And Daniel Craig seems to really love the role. Just take a look at his closing speech to the cast and crew at the end of shooting No Time to Die. Um, and a lot of people here worked on five pictures with me, and I know there's a lot of things said about what I think about these films and all of those, whatever, but I've loved every single second of these movies, and especially this one, because I've got up every morning and I've had the chance to work um, with you guys, and that has been one of the greatest honors of my life. So. Daniel Craig redefined Bond as a Heineken man, more so than a vodka martini guy, as well as set a high bar for the future of Bond. He's been in five Bond movies since 2006, which is almost as many as Sean Connery and Roger Moore. He can't have that many more in him. So what's next? No Time to Die is the latest as of this video's creation. What do you expect from the next Bond movie? Is it time to start looking for a new lead? Can the Bond franchise even survive right next to movie series like Mission Impossible and Fast and Furious? What's your dream fan casting? Dream director, even? There's a lot of rumblings about a new direction for Bond around the corner. Let us know what you think down below.